Hey guys, Dear Yoongi here and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Earlier this year, maybe 6 or 7 months ago now, I uploaded a video titled Poor Marketing Decisions in K-Pop and you guys really loved it which is great because I really enjoyed making it too. Since then I have noticed and come up with yet another list of these so today I will be bringing you Poor Marketing Techniques and Decisions in K-Pop Part 2. Like we said at the beginning of Part 1, for anybody who didn't see that one, I just want to clarify that although these decisions may not have been made for marketing purposes, they could have had some detrimental effects on the marketing of a company or their group. So that is what we'll be exploring today. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. The first poor marketing decision I wanted to discuss is the changing of a group's name. I think almost every company would agree that establishing a brand that is both uniquely yours and recognizable to your audience is one of the hardest things to do. But what is even harder than this is trying to change this brand once it has already been established. Anything as little as your brand's colors that are everywhere all over your product and logos to as big as your company name which is plastered all over your product and watermarks. This is why it also makes me wince a little bit when I hear of a k-pop group changing their name. Think of it similarly to that email address or username that you came up with when you were like 12 years old that you now find super cringy. That's a choice you made and committed to and it can't be so easily changed when it's linked to every account you have ever made and you can't change it. The same goes for a k-pop group who changed their name when it's connected to all of their existing work and everything you know about the group. The thing is, sure, labels will always have their reasons for doing this and sometimes groups themselves might not have a choice. For example, Brave Girls when they moved labels and their old label kept the rights of the name Brave Girls and they legally had to change to BB Girls. But we're talking about incidents where the company just decided to give the group a fresh new look or catchier name. Examples of this that immediately spring to mind for me are two spelt like T-O-O, changing their name to two, spelt like T-O-1, T-1419, changing their name to T-F-N, Kingdom, changing their name to The Kingdom. This one is the worst for me. I don't know if it's just because of the Mnet reality TV show Kingdom and that's why they had to change, but even if it is or isn't, this was just an absolute no from me, I'm sorry. The reason why this sits so badly with me and I'm ranting about it is because a group's name is literally their identity and the first thing a fan or aspiring future listener will see about them, which is why it's such a big deal. It is also very heavily influencing your search results when people look up the group on a search engine such as Google or even on social media. The company might think that the name change will benefit the group in ranking higher in future searches, but what about everything that was formerly there and connected to this group? It's not gone per se, but it is going to be hard to connect any of that to the new name and keywords you're now using. So you can kiss any of that SEO, search engine optimization, you've already spent so long on doing goodbye. It's never as simple as just changing a group's name and all the attention and maybe even more that they used to be getting will follow them. It's a major risk and one that we can see just from past groups that I'm sure we can all think of hasn't necessarily really paid off to make it worth it. Okay, let's move on to a different decision in K-pop that can poorly affect a group's marketing and that is not subtitling content in another language. As many of us know, K-pop is a huge global success now and the large majority of K-pop groups will have fans outside of Korea. Some K-pop groups may even find that they have a greater number of fans scattered around the globe than they have making up their local domestic audience. It is the job of a marketing and data analyst team to find out this information because this can be crucial to the continued growth of an artist. Once they have this data, companies should be using it to their advantage. If you discover that your artist has an audience in, say, India, for example, of like 50 plus percent, then why on earth are aren't you subtitling that extra behind the scenes content on the group's YouTube channel in Hindi? Or at the very least, I don't mean to sound so English or like Eurocentric here, but at the very least, if companies are looking at their data and seeing that they have a large global audience and don't have the resources available to subtitle in a variety of different languages, it would still be a good idea to seek English subtitles for the group's content because English is one of the most widely spoken languages globally and will definitely help reach a large audience. Don't get me wrong, 
Young, I work for a global company myself, operating around the world in multiple languages. And I know firsthand just how expensive it can be to get anything translated from its original language to another. But this is why a marketing budget exists. And it's down to the company to decide what exactly they put value on and the way in which they want to try and grow their artist's fan base if this is one of their objectives. If a company wants to continue to grow their group's global success, this is one of those little things that could really help make a difference when giving a group an edge over others who might not be able to offer something like this to their fans. Next decision I've noticed in K-pop which I think is poor marketing is last minute tour announcements. I don't know how many times I've spoken about these before and in what context. For example, I think I mentioned last minute tour announcements as one of the ways K-pop companies are trying to take our money in that mini series I did because it creates a sense of panic and makes fans feel as though they have no choice but to buy tickets or miss out. But as a marketer who has planned events, the idea of not giving the actual event attendees enough time to plan their attendance is just crazy to me. If I go to an exhibition or trade show for work purposes, that event was usually announced a year in advance, sometimes even longer, just to ensure everybody who is interested to attend can make it for one. But to also give the company organising the event adequate enough time to plan everything to perfection and to advertise the event. When K-pop companies announce tours at the very last minute, a couple of months before the tour kicks off or sometimes even later, this allows the marketing department absolutely zero time to build up a significant enough buzz around the event. Sure, they can advertise the tour now and generate some excitement, but to properly build up hype for something like a tour, this can and will take time. The marketing team needs to be able to remind fans of the upcoming tour over a stretch time frame to allow for that re-messaging and reminding fans of the importance of wanting to buy tickets. The whole idea of panic announcing a concert or tour at the last minute might appear as though it works financially, but from a marketing perspective, you're not doing the event anywhere near as much justice as it could be getting. And a marketing team could be helping with the organisation of the event by having sufficient enough time to help push it, which is why not announcing the tour earlier and having the marketing team help work their magic is such a missed opportunity. Another very poor marketing decision is being completely inactive on a group's social media profiles. A lot of labels do the right thing in creating social media accounts for their artists because nowadays in the day and age we're in, social media is one of the best ways for artists to reach their fans. However, some companies then commit an absolute business marketing sin, which is not being active enough on these platforms or posting on these accounts. And this is infuriating to me as someone who does a lot of social media marketing because a lot of the time, the artists or group members themselves would love the opportunity to be able to speak with fans on social media and connect with them more but then the labels won't let them do it or have their own accounts and then the artist has to kind of just watch their Instagram or Twitter profile sit dormant because nobody at the company is posting on there for them and they won't let them do it themselves. I know a lot of us might have social media accounts that we don't post on all that often but it's quite different if it's a business account because in order to maintain your space amongst competitors and for the platform to continue to push you and your content it will still want the constant reminder that you're actually there and contributing some something worthy of pushing to an audience. If say for example a K-pop group has an Instagram profile that they post on randomly every four or six months, there's a few potential issues they may face. The algorithm may not favour you at all because you're barely ever here, so unless you pay an extortionate amount of money in advertising and sponsorship fees for your posts, they'll just get lost amongst the sea of other posts that get published every second. The audience of current people who were following you may no longer be as active as they once were. People who followed or subscribed to you when you used to be active might not use that platform anymore themselves and therefore will not be engaging with anything you post. Less likes, comments and interactions equals, again, less the platform will be willing to push your content. And another issue with being inactive on a group's social media is simply getting lost in the updates and not being able to move with the times. Social media is constantly changing the way its algorithms work and the way it wants businesses and brands to use it. Therefore, in order to get the most best possible results out of a platform, it would be crucial for marketers to keep up with these changes or else you're going to struggle using the platform. And in these sorts of circumstances, an idol or group's profile would suffer because those running it will have no idea how to reach a wider audience and will not be getting anywhere near as much out of the accounts as they could be. All because there wasn't that initiative taken to post maybe once every few days or even once a week. There's even platforms that you can now use to help you do this and schedule things in advance quite inexpensively. The next poor marketing decision I wanted to discuss is kind of like one we've already spoken about but 
the complete opposite. And that is when a group rebrands with an all new member lineup but keeps the same name. I know this might sound a bit confusing, but I can explain. So we've already discussed how I think a group changing their name is a bad idea when it comes to their search results and everything they've done so far. This one, however, is when a group decides to keep the same name, but rebrands themselves and re-debuts with a whole new member lineup. Now, this isn't something unique to K-pop. There's quite a common practice in the pop world to do this. For example, where I live in the UK, we've had a three-member girl group called the Sugar Babes, and they had had multiple different iterations of their lineup, but kept the same name every single time. This has happened a few times in the K-pop world too, with groups such as Rania, who had multiple lineups before eventually changing their name too. But just because this is something that is common practice within the pop world, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing, and from a marketer's perspective, I don't think it's a good idea. Like we said for the name changes, I know labels may have their reasons and justifications for wanting to keep an older group's name alive, even with an entirely new lineup, and this is likely due to the label wanting any success a group had to live on, rather than starting from scratch and maybe not having any success at all. But looking at this as a fan, it's sad because this does not allow the new members any opportunity to establish themselves as a new group, because even though they are, they kind of aren't, if that makes sense. They might be new to the group, but they have no choice but to fill the shoes of those before them, rather than getting to now start their own legacy and build their own audience and reputation. But looking at this from a marketer's point of view, my issue is with how this messes with the group's brand and everything we know of them. A group's name and brand is part of what we associate with them and as part of their history, as well as the group's lineup and the members. Therefore, a whole new group should not be using an old group's name, because it's an entirely new entity and therefore should be treated as one. I think this is especially important in the K-pop world more so than the pop world, because in the K-pop industry, it is heavily reliant on that relationship that fans build up with their artists. One current example that we can actually reference is 5050, because this is a prime example of a label wanting to keep an existing group's name because they were doing well. But three of the four members chose to leave the group and label, so the company are now re-debuting 5050 with the same name but as a five-member girl group, with four new members and the one remaining original member. Even though one of the original members is still part of the group, this does not justify keeping the name of 5050 in my opinion, just because the label still owns it, if that makes sense. The one 5050 member remaining, Kina, will have a completely different experience with the past 5050 members than she will with the new group and members and all of the work and music they create together. Therefore, from a marketing perspective, it makes much more sense to give the two versions of the groups different names, so fans can easily differentiate between the two, and more importantly so the group can establish a clear brand that represents them now in their current format. I hope that makes sense. Okay, last but not least, I have to talk about one more poor marketing decision, which is not promoting a comeback on music shows. I've done two of these poor decisions in K-pop marketing videos now, and this will be the 12th point I'm including. I can't believe it's taken me so long to include this one. Now, I know a lot of things have flown around on social media, I think this year, about how idols get paid very minimally to promote their comeback on a music show, and the company, of course, do have to pay for their artist's appearance on the music show. The more of these your group does, the more it will cost. However, regardless of this, all of these promotional costs will come out of the marketing budget for a group's comeback, and one should be put aside. Because part of a group coming back with a new song should involve actually promoting the track, an album, or whatever it is. Visibility is everything in K-pop. Within the K-pop industry, one of the best ways to do this is via performing on music shows, as they're still very popular as a format of media amongst the audience of K-pop fans. A lot of people watch these shows shows live on Korean TV while they air, perhaps if you're in that or a similar time zone, or otherwise, a lot of people will scroll through a network's YouTube channel and watch performances after they've been uploaded later on. A label deciding to skip these music shows or only do very few is a shame, because it's probably one of the most inexpensive ways to reach a wide audience, and let fans of other groups also see what your group has to offer at the moment, performance-wise. Through the power of captivating K-pop stages or fan cams, many groups are even individual idols have gone viral in the past and have been able to draw some new fans towards them and the group. So surely it would be worth giving it a go, especially if you have faith in what the group can offer. By skipping out on performing on these music shows, a label not only risks missing out on potential new fans, but also fails to capitalise on the momentum that a comeback will naturally generate or the interest it will get from fans, and even potential non-fans. In an environment like the K-pop world, 
it's so important that whenever possible a group gets to keep that consistent exposure for example on social media like we discussed and music shows would be another great way to remind an audience that you're still there and still relevant okay guys and that was it for today's video thank you so much for watching if you got this far and i'm sorry i didn't have a new video for last week i have just moved house so things have been super crazy at the moment but if you did enjoy this video please give it a thumbs up and i would love to hear your thoughts on these marketing choices and any others you might have thought of yourself in the comments down below if you're new here please hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to be the first to hear whenever i upload and i'll see you next time bye guys